Hi there! Welcome to this workshop uh, that we're running for gamesindustry.biz, which we've partnered with Creative Assembly. Uh, my name is Danny. My colleague here, this is this is Jazz Dat. Uh, she's the lead character artist at Creative Assembly um, and a Forbes 30 under 30 <laughs> winner. Um, so she's very successful and she knows what she's talking about. She's very, very good. Um, her specialities include creature sculpting, reptiles and dragons, comparative anatomy and design philosophy. Uh, and primarily she's been working on the uh, the Warhammer games for the past few years. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, this is Danny Sweeney. He's a senior character artist at Creative Assembly. Uh, he's on my team. He's one of my minions. Um, you've probably seen Danny everywhere across Twitter. He's done so many things. He's done so many workshops. Um, to be honest, I'm very proud of him. Aww. And um, yeah, of course. That's really and sweet. Specialities. Cool. Cool. You're welcome. <laughs> he's like pro at hard surface modeling he can do organic sculpting he can do everything he's a very very good character artist and yeah yeah that's our introductions okay so where do we begin regarding making a monster so much in the ways of a uh, dr frankenstein himself he understood uh <laughs> that creating monsters is a blend between science and art and that's especially true for you know modern day representation of creatures and monsters in video games uh we need to research we need to research and understand what the foundations are and learn what the rules are so we can break them okay mm -hmm. so here's an example of um i think these both came out at the same time the same year roughly uh one is successfully designed uh and one is a little lacking in terms of design philosophy and so it's relatively weaker looking than its counterpart yeah. on the right but the idea is that through research science and art we can learn what looks good and what looks bad uh, we want to equip ourselves as artists with an arsenal of methodologies and reasons mm -hmm. and understanding to understand how to create the best art we can um another example is a killer croc from the uh the batman games uh on the left mm -hmm. this is this was his first iteration on the left and on the right I think it's a much more successful design because uh yeah, for yeah i remember this was a big thing for you back when we were talking about this a, a while back um yeah. especially when we we're talking about reptile creatures uh but yeah so like what we have to understand is character artists work in the games industry we want to make things look as cool as they can right but there's always a level of negotiation that has to be had with the other facets of game development like do we have the time to do this can it be done within the engine limitations that we have um does it work in concept and does that concept translate to 3d mm. and if so yeah. cool so you can you know you can make <laughs> things look cool if uh, if you kind of have things in tandem you know strong concepts uh, the ability to do so on the engine uh and strong design philosophies so yeah largely today we are going to be focusing on this. Is it well designed? Can it be done? I'm going to assume yes. And does it work mm -hmm. in 3D? I'm going to assume that as character artists watching this, you understand how to translate a concept from 2D to 3D. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's always liberties that have to be taken when you're translating from 2D to 3D. But largely mm -hmm. today, we're going to be talking about how to get the best out of designs and what to consider. Or rather, what we use the team to get successful designs, you know? Like, I think you've, uh, especially your stuff, Jazz, you've created some amazing stuff, just <laughs> kind of a being, even this stuff to begin with, right? Yeah, like, as you were saying, you can't just get everything, you can't just jump into it, you know, at once. It has to be broken down into everything, like, for example, Mm. Yeah, you got to like break it down into little chunks. That's the thing. And so these the, these are the beginner chunks for me, at least. And I think yes. you can use a similar methodology. Uh, you want to research. You want to use uh, an understanding of the real world to build up uh, a repertoire of comparative anatomy. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but to, to to begin with, once you've started your, your research, you want to try and convey the character through successful storytelling uh, and so that means that you have to kind of get into the nitty-gritty of what your character is 
um, where they live, like, what they eat. Yeah, where it comes from. It's it. It's my most important thing, to be honest. It's when you're designing and making a monster, always think about its background, its character, where it's from. As Danny said, what it's eating as well, which sounds very little and doesn't sound as important, but in the end, it will make your character so much stronger. Yeah, like I always think of it like a D and D stat block. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's a really good way to to look at it, actually. Because you can obviously define its strength, dexterity, constitution, blah 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 blah, um, how fast it is, and you know how strong it is, and even its like sexuality if it has one. Um, like at all, everything informs the design, and it's important to understand those points. Um, mm. So here's it, you know, for example, um, you know, beyond just starting with those building blocks, those beginner building blocks of conveying storytelling through design, um, you also want to draw from real life. You can put pen to paper and create something like otherworldly, but really you want to draw inspiration from real life. I think that's what makes it more fun. It's like really researching what exists in the real world and then you find all these crazy obscene creatures that you can actually bring into your own designs exactly like it's it's a, it's a fun stage like researching it's really fun and it's the way towards success if you can extrapolate from your reality and then merge ideas mm. then you can create some really memorable and very fantastical looking successful creature designs it's all about yeah, just trying absolutely. to kind of use every weapon in your arsenal uh and so like mm. research is fundamental it's absolutely fundamental Always, yeah. be, be that creative research and making things up yourself or drawing from real world inspiration and so once you've done that, the kind of storytelling side of it, the who, what, where, when, and why, and drawing from like the visuals of real life, then you can kind of get into the nitty gritty of understanding and thinking about comparative anatomy. So typically, when you're designing creatures, especially kind of how we do on the Warhammer games, um, there's one of two ways you can do it. Some creatures tend to be like almost Cronenbergish, where they're kind of like super alien and there's there's, there's mm. nothing relatable about them but others will draw inspiration from like again the the skeletal muscular structures of real world creatures and so we need to understand yeah. how the anatomy works in that sense uh and the great thing is especially for like you know you, you did your kitties you know for the game yeah <laughs> um all their muscles are the so like the musculature of a cat is very similar to the musculature of a human yeah uh, yeah it's just it's like a human on four legs <laughs> basically yeah like, <laughs> it's strange uh, uh, yes but, but it's fantastic so like you know you have to kind of understand that like having a strong foundation in anatomy is very important and so that's yes, kind of what, what 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 we're trying to get across here um again t when we're talking about um you know understanding the diet of a creature that informs the visual design because there are certain visual cues that are important to us as humans when identifying predator or prey animals so an example mm. of that you know a cat is a carnivore okay so but what does that mean any anatomical sense well it means that they have a short digestive tracts right a small intestine now this will make sense in a second a sheep <laughs> is a prey animal they're a herbivore i think you know where i'm going with this one jazz right yeah so what's what's going on there huh it's a whole mess it's a whole mess that's what it is there's a whole <laughs> There's a whole gross mess. There's a whole highway system in there. Look at this boy. It's like a slinky. It's like a big slinky. Um, and so what that means is that, so for 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 predators, typically, predators will have more slender profiles. Okay. So like again, this this is important for when you're trying to convey an idea to your audience. So if you want to create a predator type animal, you want to copy this kind of visual cue and understand that the reason that this anatomical figuration, configuration sorry, is in this way mm -hmm. is because they have small intestines and they have this kind of like this slender profile. Deer, for example. So again, they have like that big mass in their belly, okay? And the same idea is for, um, you know, either monocular, binocular vision, right? So like we see here, prey animals tend to have their eyes pointing out to the side because it means they have a higher field of vision to see predators coming towards them. Mm. Dogs have binocular vision. They're looking forward. So whether or not your animal, what your animal eats, what your animal, sorry, what your creature 
eats is incredibly important towards its visual design. Again, uh, do, do you want to explain why, Jazz, the cow has such a big old belly? <laughs> All that processing of grass and yeah just hazing that's all they do hate yeah. about look around eat be lazy and then as you say like with the eyes and everything they can look behind themselves because they know that something's going to come attack them yeah exactly so like again like if you wanted to create a cattle type character this is kind of a what you would um copy right this is the kind of idea that you would go for um so the again these are just all probably exhaustive at this point but just good examples that show it matters what your character eats it matters what it t you know you have to just put a lot of research into what you um what you do for your uh just just on, just on paper before you even start thinking about design um mm. so if you want to have a, a successful design is about conveying an, Id an idea to the, the viewer or the, or the player in terms of a game and so all these things matter uh and again so the diet of an animal, again, is going to affect not just the shape of the stomach, but the musculature of the head and all around the body. So there are two major muscles in the head, I'm going to say, that um, are linked to the jaw. Uh, do you want to take this one, Jazz? Can you tell me what this Hi. one's called? <laughs> this is the temporalis muscle. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. How did you How did you know that? It's because you're so good. What's this one um, called? I'm not sure. There's, there's some words on the screen I can read. This okay. is the masseter muscle. Yeah, so th these are like probably the most important things actually. Like, every time we do study anatomy in work or anything, we always concentrate on those two mostly. Even though they look small on screen, like right now, they actually prove a massive, massive point to when you're designing a creature. Um, and what I mean is like, say if you want to create a, a monster that's quite gnarly. Uh, He's, he's a mean monster you want to give him a massive like masseter muscle and a big mandible as well it looks like he'll because it looks like they'll chomp on something they'll like just bite down and it makes them more sinister that way. yeah so the, yeah it's, it's exactly i mean these muscles are basically the biting muscle right so if you have a carnivore or an animal or a creature that uses its mouth for attacking, it's going to have huge built-up um, temporalis and, and masseter. So this is temporalis and masseter in a human. So temporalis is big and masseter is like fairly small here um, because we've kind of just grown with the arrangement and we've kind of adapted, but we, we, we are omnivores. But with this activates when you chew, this activates when you chew as well. Um, look at the, a gorilla it's crazy it's so they've actually grown a crest <laughs> on their skull just to support the masser it's fantastic so like and it's scary it's scary yeah and they have like this kind of like yeah the sagittal crest it's called uh mm. and what that means is like their anatomy has had to kind of appropriate itself to support this huge muscle and it's, it's massive it's like, it's like a big 20 pound slab of steak just in their head mm -hmm. there and again the master is you know very very large as well yeah it's just like when you see that like gorilla or ape in real life right how terrifying do they look because of that massive mass um, massive muscle matter that you see they're just like, that's they're just huge it's the same the same goes for the for for you know lizards you know lizards have you know um alligators for example have crazy strong bites um mm. they also have temporalis and uh, masseter in, in a slightly different arrangement but they're still there um they have a very very weak muscle for opening the jaw down here <laughs> though you can't open the alligator's jaw if you yeah. hold it like if, i think it's if you touch the snout or something you can't open it again yeah so because their anatomy has kind of been programmed in a way which gives them crazy high psi bites they have a small i think it's the, the um the the pterygies, or I can't remember what, mm. if specifically what it's called. No. Um, yeah. But there's a small muscle down here which affects how it opens uh, opens its jaw. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can put a, a rubber band around its face and it can't open its mouth. Yeah. Again, hippopotamus. Look at this. Look at this crest that's been built. It's evolved over mm. the years just to support a huge masseter that comes up like that. But a tiny little temporalis in comparison. <laughs> that's a good point. 
and it's got a tiny little temper analysis because all its all its force is coming from the from the masseter, just hooking down mm. there. And you see how they eat right in in on videos and stuff like they can just chomp anything in one go. Yeah, Massive there's like watermelon. It's yeah, I was gonna say the watermelon. There's like videos. Oh. There's just videos of them eating <laughs> watermelons. And so when you understand these things, you can create. You can you can blend real life imagination, um, and you know your 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 strong research together and build fantastic characters. So that's mm -hmm. what we need to understand before we enter the monster factory, which is what I call it. It's a factory where monsters are made. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> this is this is where we kind of think about okay now that we've done the research and we understand the fundamentals okay we can start to think about artistic principles yeah. which 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 run across the board doesn't matter what you're doing it could be figure drawing it could be environment art it could be character art doesn't matter these mm -hmm. fundamentals are overseen by a great all-seeing eye lidless yeah Reef you can pretty much I'm sorry no. <laughs> I, I was doing I was doing a Lord a Lord of the Rings bit, but I thought so, <laughs> and then I cut you off. No, it's fine. Um, so, do you want to explain these jazz? Yeah. So it's just, pretty, yeah. So as you say, it's like you look at a monster. It's always pretty much broken down into these four elements. You can say, and your eye can pick any of these up instantly. Flow, for example, is like um, what leads the eye to a specific part of the piece so like it will all flow to one direction and you can choose which which point you want to like make stand out like the eyes of a human if you want to make that stand out the flow should go towards the eyes mm -hmm. if that makes sense i'm not entirely sure but you see some examples same thing with balance it's like if it's too if there's too much of one thing it can it can be too noisy and mm -hmm. your eyes will wander off sort of thing you want to have a good balance of like something a little bit detailed and something empty so your eyes like a dinner you want a balanced dinner you want a balanced hey, piece of art right healthy um, bacon you know all that yeah good healthy we'll, meal we'll get into these uh obviously later um then we have like obviously shape language and forms which are about how the um arrangement of the um the, the larger and smaller details affect the piece as a whole um so flow what's flow flow is a flow you can see Literally right here, where you're pointing, it's just a really nice, like, flow, I can say. <laughs> but yeah. you can tell that your eyes go straight to the middle because that's where the main focal point is. It's, it's the idea of using that's... lines and rhythm to, to lead yeah. the eye around a piece of art. So this is how it works in just traditional art, okay? Your, your, your eyes are being controlled by the artist yeah. to look in a certain way. Right there. Or along a certain path. So I'm drawn to this orange line. And around to these concentric circles, so you successful. Yeah, you want to employ flow to create distinct focal points and to stop compositions from looking disorganized. Flow can be used in all sorts of manners. For example, like one of my favorite artists, uh, Norman Rockwell, uh, flow is being used here to point to the action. Okay, this is where the action mm -hmm. is. This is the focal point. Um, all these lines, even though they point out the way, are pointing in the way towards the action because it's kind of supported mm -hmm. by these gesture lines running up. So this is the focal point. This is where we want to look. This is where the storytelling is. Um, and this could be employed in character art, you know, very successfully. Um, notably, um, you know, a very good example is Diablo from Diablo 3. So, Jazz, you had a good example, a good way of describing this earlier. Oh, uh, yeah. It's just eyes, right? It's like all those horns on the heads, even on the arms. All if you know, You have to, like, probably look deep into it, but you can see it all just points towards those eyes the shoulder mouths i guess again like all those horns on the shoulders point straight to the to the mouth it's like there you go yeah what i'm going to do is draw it's a red pen so it's not actually the best example but you have all these lines <laughs> of gesture flowing up towards the main focal point which is the head okay like bam yes so and if, that's the perfect way of like look at this getting look at this nice gesture as well you got this lovely <laughs> gesture from these uh, spikes here, so it's, it's the idea of using flow lines, really. yeah, to create a focal point, which is up here. Okay, so that's kind of it. Um, avoid right angles when you're using flow to stress focal points because right angles are inherently mad mains. I mean, I think mm -hmm. beyond like maybe a bismuth crystal, there's not many right angles in the 
natural natural world. I might be wrong about that. But um <laughs> right angles look man made, so avoid them. Parallel lines look man made, like that kind of thing on a character, okay? Avoid them. Mm. You wanna avoid things like that, okay? Like, you know, it's just, it just makes it look constructed and the idea is you want you want it to look natural you don't want to mm-hmm. if you're building a robot make right angles by all means um because that's kind of the visual design you should be going for but when doing organic creatures maybe not so much mm. um yeah like it's, a lot of it's kind of like gesture drawing as well so these are some like old gesture drawings i did back in like 20 something <laughs> i don't know when like maybe like the early 2010s um mm. and these are some i did like a few years ago now um but you can see you instantly see the difference right like in the first one actually rather in the second one you still have like your construction lines and you still have your your i can say like rigid models i guess like your construction of the rib cage and stuff it's hard edged but you still have those super smooth and round lines you still have the curves and it makes you instantly read where the flow is going the so, strong yeah. like the strong lines of action yes you know it's much more um complementary to the eyes exactly so lines of action flow they're important uh and they they apply not just to kind of you know traditional art but also to designing successful creatures but of course mm-hmm. balance has to come into play too and balance is a strange one balance refers to how elements of a design relate to each other and so you kind of have to use it in tandem with uh, all the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, this could be through value, color, or form, which is the the main. Well, that's kind of that kind of describes everything, right? Mm. Value. There's not really anything other than value, color, or form. Um, you want your designs to be balanced, okay? Uh, imbalanced designs can be successful, but they need to be purposefully deconstructed. Deconstructed. Yeah. Because you're going to be, um, you, if you want an imbalanced design, it has to be done so to produce a specific emotional response, uh, yeah. which we'll get into later. But basically, balance, um, if you're thinking about balance in terms of color and value, you don't want to create something that looks gaudy or it looks uh, like an attack on the senses. And so that's why we have to think about visual hierarchies uh, in terms mm. of balance. So if we look at the the gradients on these these characters here, like they have strong visual hierarchies, the largest uh, proponent of the uh, higher values at the top, whereas it blends down to darker values at the bottom. Mm. There's a nice success. That's readable, right? It's, exactly. It's still... They're readable and they are, you know, very like gentle in the eyes. When we introduce color to them, the colors are balanced in terms of percentiles, which is an important thing we need to kind of think about in terms of balance because that kind of ties into forms as well it's not just color so yeah. when we think about this what we have to kind of consider is what do we want our primary color to be okay so the primary color is the primary reads in terms of uh you know clarity of color so blue brown, brown <laughs> red and brown, brown <laughs> purple uh greenish yellow um yellow. like that's yeah that, that, that's kind of the main, the main read we're getting from these okay and it, it's successful because like, that's the, the main thing we're picking out um so in terms of you know how this works is that through the use of balance and color you can evoke a specific response and this is successful th- this is very common in mascot characters who mm. you know in a franchise we understand to uh perform a certain action right so like fire types are always kind of red as their as, as their primary color or yellow they have a warm tone water types are blue mm-hmm. grass types are green it's you know it's it's, it's tried and tested and it you know is very much the like a, a successful proponent in conveying an idea to the player you know if something's mm-hmm. a poison character then it's going to be like purple and that green and purple yeah exactly so like you want to consider this but you you, you don't want to go overboard because you want to complement those colors with secondary and tertiary ones okay so these are perfectly balanced yeah you examples. don't want like something that's like pure red on the same value you know it's always good to have that balance it always convey something exactly so something else that i kind of considered is important is a uh, the 70 30 rule did have i kind of talked to you about this one before no, 
actually no okay this is new to me. so <laughs> yeah it's, it's something that i can consider right if i want a, a character to be like fierce and spiky and harsh i'm going to use 70 percent harsh lines and then 30 percent soft lines to balance them out so then you have balance okay mm. now my math is poor but that should add up to 100 <laughs> percent um, Wait, 70, 80, 90? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, so you can see we have lots of harsh lines here, okay? So we're achieving balance through form. So if this was spiky all over, it would just be too noisy to look at, okay? Yes. Yeah. But we have these nice rest areas, okay? These smoother areas, which help balance these areas of high noise and high frequency. And because they're high frequency, they also create focal points. Forms. Focal For point and flow. This is getting a bit messy. It all adds up. Yeah, but so like, <laughs> these are focal points now, and what are these areas? What are these spiky focal points? In terms of this character design, would you say? Because they're spiky, the triangles, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's evil. It's nasty. It's gnarly. Or they're so dangerous, kind of show... right? Yes. So it shows the main, the main points of this creature. Um, like where it's mostly dangerous, exactly. where to watch out and where to look out from is from these specific points. Exactly, and it's also using color here too, because all the all the parts of the the the, the rathalos, which are dangerous, are like tipped black, and dark. And, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like again, successful design by using balance through shape and color, fantastic. <laughs> and the, we can we, we can keep doing that through all of our designs. Again, just a just a good example of flow, um, and balance. So like, mm. largely. There's not much noise here, okay? Mm. It's kind of nice. It's gentle. There's nothing much to look at. All the noise is through the forms and silhouette here, but there's also a nice flow leading towards this large rest area and the mm. main body of the piece. I just thought it was quite nice. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, Something so sinister. It's very curvy. Do you remember Sorry. that guy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so... Let me ask you this, Jazz. Oh no. Um, <gasps> so th this guy kind of breaks the rules that we've been talking about. There is, there's, there's purposeful imbalance in this design, you know. Um, so he's in balance, but he is kind of mutating, you know. So like that's kind of by design. His imbalance is mm. successful because it's, we're, we're, we're evoking a emotional response. He's supposed to use uh, so the imbalance in design can it usually evokes um, horror or fear, like there's something mm. not quite right, like something's wrong, and so that that's kind of like why this design is so successful. Uh, Berkin, mm -hmm. so this is Berkin from Resident Evil Two. Um, he's monstrous as he becomes infected, but he slowly becomes symmetrical as he perfects himself over time. Mm. You know, as he evolves. So where's the focal point? If you're pointing to the last one. Sorry, I'm this not sure this one here. The first one. Oh, the first one. There you go. Yeah, it's not pointing anywhere. Uh, it's that massive, ugly ass eye. <laughs> Hello. It's gross. It's this. It's like screaming at you. <laughs> it's this. It's also, in terms of flow, this entire arm. The, the thing you yeah. should be afraid of, right? You know? As I, as, this is like warning bells. You know? Stay away from this. Stay away from me. Mm -hmm. Again, this one, the eye. Uh, but again, huge imbalance through design. This is the weaponized part of him. Uh, and then he becomes symmetrical over time. Um, he He's obviously spooky to look at, but he's still, mm. um, you know, designed in a way that makes him kind of balanced thematically because he's kind of like now the perfect hunter in the game. He's, you know, yeah. he's, he's kind of perfected himself. Uh, but and usually... It goes... On you go, oh, sorry. sorry. I was going to say, sorry. It goes back to your thoughts your first point of storytelling, right? Mm. It's still readable in every stages, even though it's un unbalanced, it's purposely imbalanced, but yeah, it's telling that story. Exactly, it's telling the story of him kind of slowly transforming to the, the perfect life form, almost. So shape language, we, 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 know, we know about shapes. A few shapes. How many shapes do you know, Jazz? Like seven. Se seven shapes, I'm very proud seven of you. Seven shapes, um, <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, through shape language, we can convey a lot through shapes, uh, and largely shape language is done through primary form, like silhouette. So we need to try and think about how the use of shapes in our silhouette, in our, in our, in our, in our major reads, uh, imbues mm -hmm. designs with personality. 
So the same character. Mm. What's the difference? All these shapes. They're, they're, yeah, exactly. So this one's made of circles. This, <laughs> one, this one's made of squares. This one's made of triangles. Yeah, so I guess like they all tell their own like character, I guess. Like for like if it's a circle shape, circle is cute because it's round. It's it's like adorable. So if you do want to convey a cute monster, round shapes is the way to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something like square, like in the middle, really strong. I guess it's mm -hmm. like a like like you say with the with the draw, right? It's a massive exactly. shape. It's strong, um, stubborn, um, even yeah. slow maybe. So that's, yeah, absolutely. Like if you think like, maybe maybe slow, like maybe dim go. as well. Like kind of like kind of mm -hmm. kind of dim or sl or like a. And triangle, I would say, like, fast, you know? Sleek. Yeah, like, very sleek. Dangerous as well, for me, anyway, because I see I've probably sculpted, like, so many horns on different monsters. It's just, like, spiky. It's dangerous. Yeah, you're uh, totally right. Yeah, you know. So the same idea, but different different emotional responses. So your primary read, your silhouette, matters. Uh, a great oh, example, yeah. this Pikachu from 400 BC. Um <laughs> Uh, is kind of he's very there's not kind of a lot of rhythm yeah. in his design and there's a lot of right angles and a lot of balance. This is just better proportions and is using softer shapes. Like look at this, look yeah. at the ears here. There's like a triangle, but these ones are kind of like little slight curve. It's it's so subtle as well, but compared to the first one, but it does really push that cuteness overload look. You know, even look at his feet here. Compared to his like feet here, you know these these little triangular yeah. breakups kind of break up the design. He's a lot cuter here, and there's a lot more flow and shape language kind of being obeyed, and it's just uh, yeah, he's a much more successful design here. Yeah, and it's obeying a lot of the points that we could have talked about. Um, Smog, kind of the same oh, idea. Favorite. So like ferocious, mm. right? We have these this large line here okay great line that's like like you don't want to touch those you know they're gonna like pinch right through you and we have triangles so the the triangle the triangular shapes are telling us he's ferocious and what are they all mm -hmm. doing they're all pointing through flow <gasps> so they're all flowing direction. down to the heads and in this example here as well yeah they're all flowing towards the heads toward the focal point because this is where you want to be looking um, I guess this is a very common, I want to say, like, a demon uh, design, I guess. Like, if you want to create a monster that's very demonish, always think about the horns on the head and how they just point right to that, to the eyes and to the sinister smile. It, it really, really works. Exactly. So, like, also, check out this line here, okay? So you have this kind of balance here. We have a strong, straight line and then mm. curves. The curves oh, down true. here break up the monotony of the straight lines because there aren't really curves yeah. anywhere else on the character, okay? The, the curves in the silhouette are formed by the kind of break up on the neck here. So there's a Even lot... Even on the sides, like... Yeah. On the neck, you know, they have that, that spike, go, the spines running down, but you still have those round forms mm. rounding it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all it's all seeking that balance, you know? Um mm uh forms and so forms are again we kind of talked about them already but they are the your primary form is your silhouette and that's kind of what the shape language um section was mm -hmm. about right um mm. so your silhouette is a you know i'm sure you could recognize any one of these characters based on this uh this slide yes 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 um so your primary form <laughs> is your silhouette uh, we need to learn how to break up forms to create focal points and areas of rest. So any other form within the character design is within the silhouette. Over, di over designing something can destroy a good design. And so you want to make sure that you understand the, the hierarchy of forms. Primary, secondary, and tertiary. So your primary form, as I've said, is silhouette. Um, the secondary form breaks up the silhouette and frames mm. the tertiary forms. And the tertiary forms attracts the eye this mess see danny post has this picture all the time sometimes and it blows my mind because my brain cannot comprehend these colors and that's what makes it work <laughs> <laughs> so it has it's like a massive like big forms but then it's just overpowered with noise treasure 
the one word I can't say, tertiary forms, which is the noise essentially, it's, it's all overpowering. So you can see how that translates on the right, right? In the picture, it's just noisy, very noisy. It's nothing yeah. balanced in there. So there's a, bad, there's a bad hierarchy of forms here. So you have large primary forms, kind of secondary forms smattered around, okay? Mm. But then you have equidistant and arranged tertiary forms represented by these yellow squares and your eye is drawn to the yellow squares mm. there's nothing you can do about it and this is kind of like reminiscent of like just like gaussian noise like it's just unreadable it's just mess it's not readable at all it's 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 not it's just not great but if we take this concept and arrange the forms okay if we arrange yeah. the forms then we can create focal points and <laughs> areas of rest yeah, that's the main, very important thing, is you need an area of rest. And we can make things see look more natural. Area. It's an important concept to kind of understand. For example, in the Dark Elf Dreadlords, here's an example and breakdown of the forms used in them. So their primary forms are the silhouette, as you can see all the red parts. The blue parts are the t secondary forms, which kind of still break mm -hmm. up the silhouette, but in a, less, in a lesser way. And the tertiary forms are specifically here, um, utilizing focal points and flow or areas of interest tiny. tiny little things okay tiny little things and you can see how it's a successful design based mm. on a strong breakup of forms i'm so quite, so quite happy with these ones um, <laughs> yeah, because... so next up i have some examples of uh other creatures which kind of employ all the good things we've talked about i love these they're it's great, horrible. right? So, do you want to talk about any of the things here? Like, what what do you what do you see? I see flow. Yeah, it's interesting when I said adorable, right? Because it's like it's round, but they still have um, just those little bit bit of noise of the sharpness. Like mm -hmm. you say, it's flow, it's shape language. So yeah, I see like a perfect um, S form, but it just has a little bit of balance with the spikes and such. Absolutely. And I still think it's a really cute design. Like, I still read it as adorable. It's super cute. Um, and it's got, mm. you know, a fantastic break breakup of um, balance. You have these, mm. these focal points, and these focal points are not just uh, kind of um, jumping at you in terms of their um, the noise and the silhouette, but rather in the color breakup as well, because it's, mm. you've got these green stripes, it's creating these focal points, you know? Um, mm. Just very, very well balanced and very, very nice and friendly. Uh, but also yeah. kind of potentially dangerous, potentially barbed. So, you know, but really a really success successful design nonetheless. Um, Always, yeah. Another great example. Look at this gorgeous flow here. Yeah. Such a big creature. And then it just like turns into this like beautiful, lavished um, fins and such. It's exactly. really, really well done. And look at the balance of color. Yeah. Nice break of a color. And also... Look at the forms up here. What's going yeah. on with these? Where, where's your focal point? It's not even. It's, it's not that much, but it's there. Yeah, it's like just... you, can, you can see them, and it's, it's it's not noisy or anything. It's just a good balance. Exactly, exactly. Just a very successful. Just a very successful design. Same um, with the valleys as well, right? Uh oh. Yeah. No. Absolutely. <laughs> uh oh. Absolutely. <laughs> um. So another another great example is um. I think we looked at these scales when we were doing Dark Elf stuff, but uh, in terms of tertiary forms or secondary forms and the arrangements we were talking about just a moment ago, you can see all these squares next to each other. It's too much. Sorry. <laughs> it's it's like a chessboard. And you can, you can see like why research is important because if you're trying to, this is, this is a crocodilian, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you need to convey that information if you're trying to pass it off as a almost like a, a reptile in mm -hmm. a sense and that's why this first one it really doesn't work because nothing is so unnatural like nothing um flows together it's all just one shape mm -hmm. the squares it's just one but you take a look on the right and you can really really see like they put some proper research into that belly you know there's like certain parts where there's a bigger scale mass and then smaller scales like on the wrinkles on the rest area in the middle and then a massive mass i'm touching the screen thinking everyone could see me 
And There's the one drawing thing map. is down. Yeah, you can draw for me. But yeah, um, you're right. And also just like, so this is much better arranged. It's not, yeah. um, your eye isn't confused or drawn to this strange kind of focal point now, but rather you're looking at the heads. You're looking at this, again, look, look what we've got here. Look, look what's going on. Yep. Look what's right going on here. to the middle. Isn't that great? Yeah, to the glowy eyes. you got and flow grin, going on. You know. From these ridges. That's how you do it. It's so, it's so, so successful. It's great. Mm. Um, and just a nicer silhouette overall. You yeah. know? Just a stronger, just... a stronger primary shape. It gives way more. Um, you understand more of the story of this guy. Like, he's massive. He's evil because he's hunched over and he's got these massive scales on his back that's going to hurt you. <laughs> exactly. It's great. Exactly. It's great. That's how you do storytelling. And again, as the last example, not a great example of visual hierarchy here mm -hmm. on the one on the right. I don't know where I'm supposed to be looking because everything is just noisy. There's not mm -hmm. really any primary forms for me to look at. So like I don't yep. I don't understand what I'm looking at here. I think he's probably a bit confused himself. I think so. <laughs> he's like, hmm. Um, who am I? But if we look at this one here, look at how great this is. So, it's just simple as well. It's, it's just simple. simple. Shapes. There's large shapes. Nice and large shapes. And this is shapes. a man-made thing, right? It's it's still. That's a really good still point. Curves and you still want hard shapes, kind of thing. Like it's it works, in terms of balance. It works in terms of balance. And there's areas of rest and areas of interest to look at. You know, there's a better hierarchy of forms, as mm -hmm. I'm kind of um, indicating here. So yeah. primary, secondary, tertiary, like these kind of. Uh, you just old... made a smiley face now. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's already there. There's already, there's already, <laughs> already another happy face. There's, there's, there's a, nose. these kind of pistons and stuff in here, or also your. Just yeah. Your kind of tertiary forms as well, you know. But like, there's a there's more balance. There's not just noise. This is all just noise, and I don't know. Mm. What? And it's no balance of color either. Like it's still, even the color is just so noisy to my eyes. Yeah. You look on the left, you can see it's it's yellow with a hint of gray. You know. Like, st still, still probably in some eyes a success a successful design. This one on the right, but mm. I think in, the, in terms of rules that we we're talking about today, not a great example of them. I hope that was informative because we are now at the end of the session. Uh, oh. so that's kind of just the <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's kind of the rules that we talk that we kind of employ on the team when we are um, designing things, uh, and I hope yeah. that that was an informative uh, kind of run through, kind of quick run through of what we kind yeah. of employ and what we talk about. A quick run through. What do you uh, think, yeah, Jazz? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's like you say. That's pretty much our bible. I think it's like anytime we start a new creature, a new character, we always have those elements in mind. And yeah, I think that's just what makes anything work. Even the most fantastical creature that you can't really rely on much anatomy or something, if you at least have story or balance or anything behind it, it will be a successful creature. Exactly, you know? exactly. It's preparation. Uh, mm. pre preparation is everything. And understanding those rules that we've talked about just helps you troubleshoot when you're stuck. And that's yes. the big thing, you know, we want to be success successful at what we do uh, as artists and we want to have the best tool sets available to us to convey what we want to to the viewer. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 the big thing for, for me, I think, is that um, yeah. it's really about just trying to kind of successfully tell a story, you know, a picture, t a, a picture tells a thousand words, etc. So you know yeah. you want to you want to read as much as you can for, uh, from that first from the first time you see something. Is it friendly? Is it dangerous? Is it a mutant? Is it a big cat in a hat mm -hmm. <laughs> that I can pat on the head? Oh no! Oh Here no! It comes. Uh, but yeah, like that. That's a that's why these these kind of rules are like close to my heart, I suppose, and I think they are to yours yeah. too. Because yeah. I've done well sticking by them. Yeah. But always. yeah, 
so I guess that's it. Yeah. Anything else you um, want to add? That's it, really. I think we pretty much covered like the base, really. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, th- th- I will say this has been a strange interaction in a way because usually we would be in person and it would be easier yeah. to kind of be like, no jazz can talk. It's very strange because like... Yeah, now I feel bad because I'm probably cutting out everything that you're saying. Oh, no, and stop. I don't it's fine. <laughs> it's a very bizarre thing it's, for me. It's more that I just talk a lot. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, but yeah. yeah, cool. I guess that's it then. So thank you very much yeah. for joining us. Uh, and I hope you thank have you a wonderful guys. day.